comes on. Benefits of the United States federal government's use of offensive cybersecurity operations outweigh the harm. Contention one is securing the United States. If the United States didn't use offensive cybersecurity operations, the U.S. would be forced into a defensive posture showing U.S. weakness. Lewis 16 of the CSIS writes that a purely defensive cyber posture cedes the initiative to the opponent and leaves the defender in a reactive posture, something no military should do. Fortunately, an offensive approach can deter and prevent attacks from occurring. Goldsmith 12 of Harvard University explains that if the the U.S. detects a threat, the DOD can conduct operations that can stop them from happening by deterring foreign countries from attacking in the first place or preemptively attacking imminent cyber threats to take them offline. Critically, deterrence is, a, is key to prevent future cyber attacks. As Kugler 17 of the NDU writes, that cy major cyber attacks can be prevented through a cyber deterrence strategy that includes reassuring allies, dissuasion, readiness to respond, and the ability to project sufficient strength. Preventing a cyber attack saves the economy. As Pisani 18 of the CNBC contextualizes that a cyber attack against the United States could trigger the next financial crisis, concluding that cybersecurity threats have become the most important near-term threat to financial stability. A financial crisis bred out of U.S. economic decline would be disastrous, as Blanchard 13 of the IMF finds that the next global economic recession would push 900 million people into poverty. Contention two is counterterrorism. Currently, Trump is removing U.S. troops from foreign conflicts. Rasmussen 19 of the Wall Street Journal finds that Trump is pulling out most of the troops from northern Syria, leaving just a few hundred behind to protect oil fields. However, such military backout will bring consequences. As Kirkpatrick 19 of the New York Times finds that Trump's troop pullout removes the spearhead of the campaign to defeat ISIS, giving them their biggest win in more than four years. Critically, Babra 19 of CyberScoop confirms that without physical troops or drones, our only option to stop ISIS is offensive cyber operations because kinetic options are no longer available. Cyber operations prevent the rise of ISIS in two ways. First is blocking their media capabilities. Cyber offensives have already proven successful. Temple Rastin 19 of NPR explains that JTF Ares, a unit of Cyber Command, was able to delete critical files, lock key ISIS leaders out of their accounts, and decrease recruitment, forcing ISIS's media capability to become a shadow of its former self. Indeed, Bait 17 of the American Security Project confirms that ISIS's international recu recruitment collapsed after US OCOs broke down ISIS's capability for propaganda. Critically, Castleberry 19 of George Washington University explains that publicity and digital technologies are the lifeblood of terrorist groups, and since these assets are key to regrouping and planning physical attacks, media resurgence is a precursor to ISIS's physical revival. Second is by blocking financing. As Temple Rastin continues that a key component of JTF Aries to, is to disrupt crucial financial links and banking options for ISIS. Critically, Duhame 15 of the American Banker finds that ISIS relies on the banking systems of Syria and Iraq to fund their operations, concluding if the U.S. could effectively regulate banking systems, ISIS would not be able to rise to power. Overall, Rogers 18, the second commander of Cyber Command, finds that cyber operations have been key in removing ISIS from strategic geographical locations, helping to reduce ISIS's territory by 98%. The impact of containing ISIS is twofold. First is preserving Middle Eastern stability. Without OCOs, ISIS would be able to rise to power. The last time ISIS was in power, Jameson 16 of NBC finds that more than 18,000 civilians were killed and millions were displaced. Second is preventing grid collapse, as by day of 15 on the Journal on Information Systems writes that terrorists so far have been prevented from having strong enough financing to launch a full out cyber attack. However, with the requisite financial and human capital, they would be able to take down the grid. Unfortunately, Smith 14 for the Wall Street Journal writes that a coordinated cyber attack on the grid would likely collapse the entire US power network, creating a blackout that would last at least 18 months. Catastrophically, CBN 18 finds that a cyber attack on electrical grids would be incredibly damaging, cutting off electricity that would leave millions of Americans without food, clean water, and access to healthcare, causing starvation, disease, and mass death, and thus he died in firms. one is escalation with Russia. Russia is not a cyber risk right now, but they have the power to retaliate if provoked. Levine 18 writes that experts say that while Russia's grid attacks may seem aggressive, they have actually been comparatively restrained. Instead, Moscow seems to be signaling its capabilities. In the U.S. specifically, there has been talk of doing something against Russia. They want the option of doing something back. There are two reasons why Russia will escalate with the United States as a result of OCOs. The first is Western influence. 
Russia views U.S. cyber operations as undermining Russia. Churovich 19 contextualizes that the Kremlin cyber authorities hold an immutable view that the U.S. seeks to undermine Russia's position at every turn along the digital front, positing or uh, um, po pointing to U.S. cyber operations behind global incidents that are unfavorable to Moscow's foreign policy goals. Russia thinks that Western influence as a result of OCOs is an existential threat, which leads to cyber escalation. Kostchuk et al. in 2018 explains that concern is widely shared by Russia, whose greatest fear is circulation of Western-influenced information. Even a minor violation of such harmony in the society supported by the control of information can quickly lead to escalation of the cyber action ladder. Because Russia views the West as a threat, they will react to any U.S. aggression, which is proven empirically. As late in 2018 writes, there is the very real prospect of escalation. Russia already showed it was willing to go beyond previously established understandings of cyber warfare, and Putin can do worse. The second is miscalculation. Russia is likely to overreact to OCOs out of national security beliefs. Greenberg 19 explains that one very plausible miscalculation would be if U.S. Cyber Command were to penetrate Russian grid networks only to prepare the battlefield, but Russians misinterpret the intrusion as an immediate threat. In this scenario, Russia would be extremely likely to escalate because the U.S. has more to lose in a cyber war than Russia does. Greenberg continues that the U.S. economy and infrastructure is far more reliant on digitization and automation than Russia's, giving the Kremlin an inherent advantage in any future no-holds-barred cyber war. If you are doused in gasoline, don't start a match-throwing contest. The impact is the cyber energy sector. Russian hacking targets key U.S. infrastructure. As Smith in 2018 writes, the potential attack scenarios are becoming so dangerous that we can't wrap our brains around them. Russian government cyber actors target government entities and multiple U.S. critical infrastructure sectors, including energy, nuclear, and water. The impact is devastating. Connors in 2019 writes that successful attacks on a major position in the uh, portion of the U.S. electric would have disruptive and deadly effects. Imagine a U.S. in which the internet would cease to operate. Food and clean water supplies dwindle and run out, and in such situations, a large number of deaths are likely, and a societal breakdown can occur in as little as one week. This would cause significant damage to the U.S. economy. Reuters in 2015 explains that a cyber attack which shuts down parts of the United States power grid could cost as much as $1 trillion to the U.S. economy. This is crucial, as recession in the U.S. would spread throughout the world. Malden 18 indicates that U.S. recession will become a global recession as happened in 2008 because of economic linkages with the rest of the world. A recession will be devastating for those on the edge of poverty. As the IMF in 2013 terminalizes, over 900 million people are expected to remain vulnerable to being pushed back into poverty in the face of adverse shocks. Contention 2 is undermining nuclear deterrence. OCOs decrease certainty around nuclear deterrence. Lindsay 19 writes that cyber operations which rely on deception tend to undermine the stability of nuclear deterrence which relies on transparency. Anything that, co that, that contributes to information asymmetry is a potential source for bargaining failure and war. This increases the risk of conflict. As Lindsay furthers, the combination of cyber and nuclear capabilities may in effect constitute a doomsday device that might be triggered despite the wishes of the principal actors to avoid it. Given the high cost of nuclear war, every risk factor matters. A nuclear war with Russia would be disastrous. Acts 19 um, quantifies that a plausible escalating war between the United States and Russia would leave 90 million people dead within the first few hours. This terminalizes to extinction. As Lamb in 2008 warns, torrents of smoke ascend into the atmosphere to entomb the planet in billowing black clouds of ash. The result is plummeting temperatures and the death of life on planet Earth. That's what indicate. Uh, can we take a little bit of breath? about Russia, both of you are warned are reliant on like just a small infraction causing this escalation, right? Sure. Yeah. So when the US hacked or like put malware bombs in the Russian grid, why didn't this like escalation ladder happen? Um, it wasn't big enough. What do you mean it wasn't big enough? We it have malware bombs in their entire grid. It wasn't what an aggressive it? it wasn't an aggressive enough attack. Are you talking are you referring to the June example, right? Yeah. Okay, so what we did in June was we just got access to the networks. Russia just kicked us off in the next two days, and they didn't no. see us as that big. We got into the networks and then put malware bombs there. So, what, like, like what event would be enough to cause the escalation if I mean, it hasn't I'm happened? I'm pretty already? sure that we didn't put malware bombs in there, but like the like the event that would happen is the United States does something for the exact per like for the actual purpose of sabotaging a Russian operation or a Russian function. Let's talk about your case. Yeah. So, on your second link in terrorism about mm -hmm. financing. 
right? Yeah. So you tell me that like ISIS and terrorist organizations run their money through Syrian banks, right? Yep. Okay, so then if the United States uses an OCO to freeze financing, that means they're unilaterally hacking into other nations' banks without no. the other nations' consent, correct? No. Our argument is that you prevent ISIS from even going through the bank in the first place. If Why? ISIS doesn't have access to their bank accounts, they can't use right. their credit Right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you unilaterally like freeze the bank accounts. Yeah, like, without freeze ISIS's bank accounts, right. you don't freeze the entire yes, Syrian okay. bank without the consent of the host country. Correct? We f we freeze ISIS's accounts. Yeah. Not Syrian accounts. Yes. Without the consent of Syria. Correct. So sh I mean, sure. So how would Syria feel about that? I would say that Syria isn't going to like necessarily oppose it. Like, okay. Well, if Syria thinks that's a good thing, why can't the U.S. just tell Syria to freeze the bank accounts themselves? What do you mean? Like, you tell me that the U.S., in order to, like, get the bank accounts frozen, has to, like, do an OCO themselves, right? Yeah. Like, if, if Syria doesn't have a problem with freezing ISIS's bank accounts, then why can't the U.S. just ask Syria to freeze the bank accounts because themselves? Because Syria's main objective right now is focusing on their own conflict. It's not focusing on ISIS. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Okay, let's go to your second link about miscalculation, right? Yeah. Like, what type of an attack would cause, like, Russia to miscalculate what we were doing? Um, the same kind of a, this is the same question as the last one you asked me. I mean, let's go back like, to your case. Yeah. I, can I just ask you about your scenario? Because like, it's just like this nebulous thing that something in the future might cause this escalation. What is it? You asked me the same question at the beginning of cross. I gave you and an you answer. Did. I'm not going to do it again. Let's you talk didn't about give me an case. answer on what would actually cause it. If malware bombs didn't cause it, what I will? said it would likely be an offensive cyber operation that is done to specifically inhibit or damage an able Why is population. taking down their entire grid not inhibiting their we operation? We didn't take down their entire grid. We have the ability to, so clearly it's an Having the ability to is different than actually doing it. Okay, sure. Move on. Let's talk about financing again, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to freeze bank accounts, we need intelligence as to what banks the bank accounts are in and like who's holding them, correct? Yeah. Okay, cool. Let me describe this like yeah. Can I use the toe? Yeah, yep. right. <coughs> Can we be starting with a wing overview? Start with an overview. Terrorism outweighs any impact in the round. Kagan 16 explains the rise of ISIS would cause the U.S. to overlook global objectives because ISIS stokes fear among Americans and their attacks on the U.S. shoreless shed light on other domestic issues such as gun violence, making us turn inward. The, this has numerous implications for the round. First of all, we outweigh their, their escalation journey on a Lincoln. Kagan concludes that the U.S. ignoring international conflicts will accelerate the collapse of the global international order and the economy and thus leads to extinction. There are two implications. First of all, you can turn against them in the status quo. Escalation hasn't happened because countries fear international backlash. However, Kagan concludes that once the global order collapses, rogue countries 
could proliferate and attack because there are no multilateral checks, but then second of all, turn it again, because without global trade, countries have no incentive to avoid war. Increases in escalation, it, it, that increases escalation in their world, whereas in our world, countries work together because they want to protect trade. But then second of all, we outweigh in magnitude, Kagan concludes that a collapse of the global order and the resulting escalation would cause extinction, which they don't impact you in their first contention, which means, uh, uh, since their escalation scenario is constrained by international norms, backlash and trade. <coughs> Also, we outweigh a Lincoln because the collapse of the global economy outweighs their tiny recession impact that they talk about and on the economy impact. But then, third of all, we outweigh and then this isn't relying on Kagan, it's just weighing independently. But we outweigh on probability because it's much more probable that ISIS attacks the grid than rational state actors. Graham 07 explains that the reason why their escalation scenario hasn't happened yet is because countries are constrained by international backwards in trade, specifically with Russia, who relies on trade with the EU. Conversely, Dauphin from case indicates that ISIS has no such constraints because they're extremely radicalized and thus aren't affected by international backlash. Thus, if ISIS were to get the capabilities to attack, it's much more probable that they would fall through than the actors in their case. This is really crucial because ultimately our case is going to come first because if a revival of ISIS happens, that means that they're going to definitely attack. But then, our contention one also outweighs for two reasons. First of all, on probability, they have zero precedent for escalation actually happening, whereas we explained that previously Iran has been actively deterred from conflict. But second of all, outweigh on a short circuit because their impact has never happened because OCUs deter the enemy and attack their capabilities, meaning that they neither have an incentive nor the ability to attack. With that, go to their contention two, not their contention one. First of all, their Lindsay card literally explains that Iran was deterred from attacking because of the fact that they knew that the United States could wipe them out with one strike. At that point, deterrence is clearly working, even if Lindsay later goes on to say that the that um and that the OCOs are like super secretive. The reason why it works is because it, the, the fact that it's secretive, it deters Iran from doing from attacking in the first place because they realize that it, because they don't know the scope of the United States operations. But then second of all, the weighing from before applies because Russia doesn't want nuke war. The, the grand card literally says that the probability is zero, but now they're contention one about Russia. First of all, in Cross, they can see that, quote, there would a small infraction causes their impact. But what we would argue is that the June example already proves how there was a small infraction, yet their escalation scenario has not happened. It's been four months. Russia should have already escalated. But second of all, no one wants escalation. Jensen from Jensen for the Washington Post in 2019 explains that using OCOs signals that you don't want escalation compared to conventional purposes. At that point, you can turn against them because OCOs de-escalate de conflicts. Handler 19 for the Atlantic Council writes that OCOs are de-escalatory because using them signals that you don't want to go to war. It ensures that a diplomatic solution is reached. For example, if in Iran earlier this year, Trump had the option of kinetic warfare but chose cyber in order to show Iran that he didn't want war. That's why Manus 18 for the Naval Postgraduate Institute explains that empirically, rival states are less likely to engage in cyber conflict because of the risk of escalation. For example, in Russia and the Ukraine conflict, none of the 2,000 cyber events from 2013 and 2016 resulted in escalation. We outweigh the probability here because we have historical precedent of Russia actively exercising restraint. But then we turn their entire case because we set good norms to ensure peace. Fisher Color 18 for the Institute of Defense Analysis explains that constantly engaging with their enemies through this cyberspace helps create understandings between adversaries about what cyber action is acceptable. By increasing mutual understanding of potential threat, countries are less fearful of each other, decreasing the chance of miscalculation. Furthermore, by persistently engaging with our enemies, we can create better norms to ensure the future that uh, a future that is agreed upon by all, creating a safer future. There are three implications here. First of all, we outweigh in time frame. Even if escalation starts initially in long run countries, uh, understand each other's capabilities and adapt to them, de-escalating the conflict, which means that Russia is consoled. But then second of all, we, we link into their first contention because they're not going to be scared of Western influence at the point where they're literally creating norms with the United States, but then we also link into their second, uh, we, that also answers their second link because it, it decreases mistrust between the two because they literally know each other's capabilities. And also, we, we, there's more impact events here because Healy 19 for Columbia explains that a, an effective continued engagement is that it compels countries to shift their resources towards defense, which means that in the case of a attack, we would still be insulated from it. That outweighs our short circuit because even if escalation happens, we short circuit their impact because the attack won't even affect us very badly considering that we have such good defenses. Oh, all right. Uh, can I see the Kagan evidence? Yeah.
two more seconds. Uh, I'm going to answer the wedding first, to be clear. But, uh, so that makes two seconds. Suddenly, way over we take it they have to look inward. However, the risk we would say that recession is the ultimate look inward. Maybe there's some uh, sporadic terror attack, means there's some national security policy that gets encouraged. But there's a recession in the US that means that all policy goes away from the rest of the globe and only towards fixing our own economy. We control the best thing into looking inwards and collapsing the global order. Then they the second problem here is that I said been like operating for almost 10 years, they only this year is when like they started to stop. That means that their argument is ahistorical. And so far as ISIS was there for 10 years and was ramping up and controlled almost all of Iraq and Syria, and yet there's no this collapse never happened, but no hint that this collapse even happened empirically, their argument is really, really silly. But then, let's go down further to our, uh, let's go to our contention two. They basically say that like, they, their first argument is basically that, 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 that uh, cyber operations signal O escalation. The problem here is that they don't interact with their specific warrants. Maybe generally cyber sh shows no escalation, but Russia specifically views US OCOs as undermining its foreign policy. It's not about how like, generally OCOs are a specific war to Russia. Their second argument is basically about how de-escalation leads to no conventional war. However, they are not proving to you that the alternative to this war is conventional. So there's no alternative to this. Russia certainly would not have the incentive to attack the US if it weren't for the OCOs in the first place. They at best solve a problem they already create, but they're not even solving it anyway. But then their next response is basically about constantly engaging, and that solves for norms. There's a couple problems here, but I'll get to them later. The first one is basically that we actually set bad norms instead of good norms before we're attacking everyone. That's not a really good norm. But the second problem is that we would say that the, the Greenberg evidence answers back for this. They, they fought Russia fundamentally misunderstands what we are doing because they think that it could take other entire systems. We, if we, even if we think we're setting good norms, we're actually setting bad ones. But then they also basically make this argument about like probability, about how like, the grid was already attacked and nothing happened. However, what Reuters 19 finds is that Russia has uncovered and thwarted attempts by the United States to carry out cyber attacks on the central system of American of, of Russian infrastructure just days after we hacked them, and that they weren't really concerned about this hack, it's more like they could just kick us out instantly. Let's go to their case. On their C1, a bunch of terms. First turn, if the US getting more public cyberspace, normalized destructive attacks, rule 19 finds is that extra cyber warfare with the administration's air eagerness to rely on digital weapons, carriers with a great risk normalizing the militarization of cyberspace, Washington be uh, investing the, lowering the bar for engaging in a new domain of warfare. We cannot play whack-a-mole with the entire world trying to strike down everyone's capability. If we lose this capability, uh, every single, every other country is going to start using uh, OCOs, meaning the long term is more conflict. But the second thing is a turn again because Iran actually retaliated with the offensive cyber, which gets where the tensions rise. Assessment 19 finds that the U.S. Department of Homeland Security issued a special alert to put an increasing number of cyber attacks from Iran to have to start targeting the uh, U.S. based businesses. That means that we control the best link as far as retaliation directly leads to like their uh, their answers that we like we prefer us because we're actually giving you empirics. But the third thing is you can turn it again because preemptive offensive cyber leads um, leads to them being able to control our weapons. What Zedekin team finds is that Iran has learned from attacks like Stuxnet to prove its own capabilities. If we're just handing out weapons like li willy nilly, they're going to use them against us. Let's go to their contention two on terror at the top first turn it. OCO Lead ICE to lead to more difficult networks to spy on which harm intelligence. What Bennett 16 finds is that an adversary to the realizing network has been compromised, cutting off the arms access to the intelligence, ramping up the offensive cyber campaign against ICE will cause evil to to migrate to new communications channels. They literally tell you in crossfire this is a prerequisite to their finance argument. If we win, that intelligence goes down, we win this round automatically. But the second thing is trying it again because OCS against, uh, against ISIS undermined cooperation. The map machine 17 finds that when the CIA got wind of the operations, they became concerned that this campaign could undermine cooperation with those countries on law enforcement and counter terror. And the long Term. We cannot keep up unilateral counter terror in places halfway away around the world. We need actual partners on the ground. They literally concede the link in this in crossfire. On propaganda, the Nakashima 17 finds the reason why the propaganda went down is because we killed all of the propagandists, so that's really, not, there's an alternate cause there. On the financing argument, first turn it because turning ter terrorists away from international financing de declines our ability to track their funding. What Numa 17 finds is that de-risking has fueled a boom in informal financial services. It may, may be the West increasingly rely on informal money transfers. Driving terrorists away from the international financial system has integratedly made it easier for them to move money around the world undetected. If we want intel on terrorists, you're not going to vote for them. But the second <coughs> thing is that there's no link because terror countries don't require money Anyway, when New 17 months, there's no evidence that is ever thwarted a cyber campaign. Most attacks require very little money and person to use a wide range of money transfer and hacking systems. It's not just like a credit card. They get money a lot of other ways.
Who's third? Yeah. So on the Lindsay evidence, right, what does it say earlier in the article about Iran and deterrence? I'm not sure. I it says that Iran was actively deterred from pursuing cyber conflict because Sus they the realized... The Sussman evidence answers factors by telling you that Iran inherently yeah. escalated their but cyber But the thing is that the Sussman evidence is from June, the Lindsay evidence is from September. Right. Iran clearly learned this lesson. talking about an incident in June, so I'm not sure... No, we're talking about a September incident. That's two different incidents then, so I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah, are two different incidents. Is. Ours is more recent because it shows that Iran understands now that there's a Iran deterrent. Iran didn't understand in June, but like didn't understand in September. Yeah, like because it realized that the United States had the ability to literally take down its grid. Didn't Iran always, oh wait, the US has the ability to take down the Iranian grid? Yeah. I have. I would or at least, even if they're not, Iran's fearful of it, which is what Iran Lindsay is, says. Well, Iran was fearful of it in June as well. I'm not sure what happened between June and September that would warrant Okay, Iran well, clearly something right. changed within the Iranian government which caused them to not escalate the conflict any further. You I'm going to have a question. question. Lindsay, have Go ahead. All right, so let's talk basically about this, like, about the um, tur looking inward. Mm -hmm. So ISIS was pretty big from, like, yeah. I don't know, 2010 to 2017. So why did we see any hint of the collapse of the global order? We did. About? That's exactly what the Kagan evidence says, is that there are numerous examples of where the United States was okay. looking inward and ignoring global conflict. Okay, I'll I'm give you a few. Ask, yeah. We overlooked the Crimea conflict. We didn't respond Wait, adequately, which allowed Russia to take over Crimea. Of ISIS? Is we, that the argument? No, no, no. It's that we were looking inward. We were only focusing on domestic policy. Yeah. Another example, we let the China expand into the URI. Wait, I, I we let China about, expand into South China Sea. I want to talk about this Crimea argument, first of all. Right? Okay, it's not, it was just an example of how the U.S. is overlooking foreign conflict. That makes sense, right? The U.S. in st not stopping Russia in Crimea was because they were too busy dealing with San Bernardino attacks. At Low key, yeah. That's Low why. key, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> so maybe it's like they didn't want to get nuked by Russia and they didn't want to get in Putin's way. That would probably be like a more. Okay. Well, point. whatever. We still have like lots of other examples of it happening. Like which ones? Like when the United, like that's what led to the rise of Trump, right? Like there was more xenophobia Trump in the was United States. Of ISIS. Well, in part, yeah, it's because of the increased xenophobia that resulted from okay. us dealing with ISIS so all the time. Xenophobia came just from ISIS. Not just from ISIS, but what we're saying is that ISIS was an impetus to cause what increased xenophobia I'm in the United to understand States. Is I don't that understand why you're contesting that Islamophobia exists. Anyway, I don't have question. I'm not contesting whatsoever. I completely agree that Islamophobia exists. Cool. So, the argument you making is that it's a thing that, like, okay. some marginal increase in ISIS is not going to, like, suddenly change. Okay, so country. let's talk about Russia real quick, right? So, sure. you say that Russia has a super strong incentive to attack, right? I mean, they have a pretty strong incentive to attack, sure. Okay, so then why haven't they escalated to a nuclear conflict yet? Our argument is twofold. The first thing is that you're going to talk about like the June grid stuff. The reason why that doesn't matter is because we didn't actually carry out an attack. We just got an input, Ollie. and they were able to kick it out after two Ollie, days. you're the one who read evidence in your rebuttal that said that Russia cared about the grid attacks in June and responded to it. it kicked so why instantly. didn't they respond it with kicked, greater it force? It kicked them out instantly. That they didn't have to respond. They could just kick them out. No, it you were the, the one who said that they increased cyber attacks in response no. to the June effect. Right. Why didn't they do that? That was the Iran. You're like conflating two different countries. Our argument is that Russia just kicked us out. Iran retaliated. We'll run Russia now. Start on C1, they drop three, three turns. First they say that like it's, it relies on like this argument that we set by North. The problem is that insofar as we win the persistent engagement is good argument, we win this argument too. But then their second response is that it increased escalation. The problem is that our argument from the Lindsay evidence is, is it postdates theirs. Our argument is specific. When the US did OCOs, even if they escalated in June, in September they learned their lesson, which is why deterrence worked in September, it, it prefer our evidence on recency. Then the third response says that like Iran actually responded and is able to respond to US cyber attacks. Our argument is that there's no example of <laughs> Iran 
not actually adapting to US cyber attacks, we would specifically say that Iran hasn't adapted, which is why specifically deterrence still works. On our contention too about counterterror, they read two turns at the top. First they say that they're going to move to new communication. The problem is that in the past we've already killed the communication. The problem is the evaporate evidence gives the new one. E even if ISIS is able to research, we're going to follow them either way. So even if they try these new communication channels, they're going to stop it. Then their second response says that you can't do it unilaterally because it's going to like hurt our relations with other countries. The problem is it's literally the CIA saying it might be a concern. No country has literally come out, like ISIS or Iraq has come out and said that like, oh, US, you can't do this. We would say relations aren't going down right now because Iraq and Syria still have an interest. It's just not their interest. It's not their biggest interest in the status quo. On our first warn about the media, which is the cleanest place to vote, on the, they, they make this argument that like uh, we already killed all their propaganda. The reason why we killed all the propaganda is because we destroyed the social media. Let's go to extensions. Our argument right now is that troops are pulling out. The Rasmussen evidence explains that Trump is pulling out all these troops from Rome and Syria, except for a few hundred. That's why the Vavra evidence explains that OCRC, the only way to solve counterterror because we don't have these troops anymore. That's why we linked to the media order. The Temple Rasmussen evidence explains that when you have these media operations, it created a shadow of its former self but six months after the opportunity, which is why the vast evidence specifically says that it literally destroyed all ISIS propaganda. That links to our impact, uh, our link about the Castleberry evidence. It specifically says that media resurgence is a precursor to physical revival because of a communication and coordination, which means that if we win media, we win the ISIS link. That links into our impact on stability. The Jameson evidence goes untouched. It explains that 18,000 people are dying in millions last time the ISIS ar arise. Then go to the Wang overview. They don't adequately respond to the Kagan evidence. The first thing that they say is that recession is going to cause it. That's the problem. It only causes us to go temp uh, go inward temporarily. It literally lasts like two years. But the second uh, the second argument that they make is that ISIS uh, ISIS didn't cause it before. Arjun gives the example of like Crimea. It clearly shows that the U.S. is ignoring uh, conflict. That's why you can send the implication. A. We specifically tell you that escalation increases because the global order goes down, which means escalation like their scenario is the only increase in their world because we don't solve terror. But the second piece of weighing that goes untouched is the is that ISIS is more likely to attack than Russia. The Bram evidence explains that Russia is never going to attack because they're relying on EU trade, but the Dotman evidence explains that ISIS is more likely to attack because they don't have any constraints. Go to their case. Their entire case is based on the advocacy that any small infraction is going to cause Russia to escalate. Don't let them get out of this because that's what they conceded in first cross. Their argument literally should have been triggered by the grid attack, but the second argument is the uh, is the persistent engagement. The persistent engagement argument explains that countries are literally working to together to prevent war. At that point, we would say the really setting good norms and like understanding what uh, what is acceptable and is unacceptable prevents any type of miscalculation. evidence that we can follow them to do first. one time we're gonna keep running back.
Way extend the lace prerequisite that says that, that like the economic recession focuses United like makes the United States focus inward because they're they're, they're focused more on making their their economy better and they don't really care about international retaliation. This goes conceded. Their only response to this is that like is that like the economy means you only focus. What? what? Their their only response to this is that the economy like the economy only makes you focus inward temporarily. That's the same thing that like that, that's true with terrorism. They never proved to you that with terrorism you have to focus inward in the long term. You can always switch your policy up. At that point, both of us trigger the link into Kagan about focusing inward. Here's why we tr or here's why they trigger it more than we do because when the economy when the economic collapse and the recession spreads to the rest of the world, not only is the U S forced to look inward, but all the rest of the other countries in the world are forced to look inward, like the EU, which means not only do you lose U S counterterrorism operations, but you lose the counterterrorism operations and the same effect happens that they say it happens to the U.S., to all the other countries in the rest of the world. That means there is a more inward looking when you vote for them. Moreover, you can also outweigh them on scope. Like, that that, that like, means that like, we get access to like, all their stuff. But like, moreover, like, we also outweigh on scope. We say that 900 million is like, a lot bigger than any, any terror impact that they're going to reboot. Like, they ter they terminalize it to, to whatever, extinction anyways. So let's talk about my case. We're going to the first link on contention one about Western influence. The chair of the evidence says that, 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 that Russia doesn't like Western influence or um, cyber operations because they're lucky to undermine their political goals. The Koshchik evidence says that they view this as an existential threat, which is the lane evidence to conclude that in, in response to any aggressive attack, they're going to respond with retaliation. They have a couple of responses. First of all, they give the June example and say that since there was no retaliation there, that means our effect should have been triggered. They ignore the Reuters evidence from Malay and rebuttal, which indicates that that attack was not big enough. We didn't do anything when we got access to the grid. It only matters when we actually do something when we try to sabotage, sabotage the Russian operation. That is the narrative of our case. Moreover, they try to extend the argument about setting good norms through persistent engagement. They also ignore Malay's front lines that says with the role evidence that those norms that we're setting with persistent engagement are bad norms. We are telling people that it's okay to continuously cyber attack each other. We're telling people that cyber war is okay. The alternative norm setting, if the US didn't do OCOs, was setting the norm that no OCOs are used at all. So, so at that point, we're setting the norm that cyber, operation, like, that cyber operations are good and like that's like a really bad thing. Moreover, let's talk about their case. There are a couple of problems. The first thing is the Bennett term, which is really mishandled. We say that because that, that because like um, you are because you do OCOs on terrorist operations, that makes them like more likely to switch the networks, so we lose all of their intelligence. They say that they say that like we can just follow ISIS to different networks. One, that means that every time they switch to a different network, we go back to square one on all the intelligence that we that we get because we lose intelligence every time they switch. But second of all, call for the evidence. It does not even say even close to the idea that we can follow them to different networks. At that point, that is the cleanest link into solving terrorism because they like they even concede in first cross. There's the second link is relied on intelligence. You can't do any counter-terror efforts if you have no intelligence, if you don't know where the terrorists are, and if you don't know what they're doing. That is way more important than disabling a couple media uh, like a little bit of media capabilities and kicking people off Facebook. If you don't know what the terrorists are doing, you have no idea how to actually stop them. But on the idea of like destroying media capabilities, they, they mishandled the Nakashima evidence, which said that the reason that they don't have propaganda machine is because we literally killed them. They say that like that's because we destroyed the propaganda machine. That's not like they say that like that's because of social media. You can call for the card. No, so you literally shot the recruiters in the Middle East. Like, in the Middle East, like that's like the alternate cause. So like, their link doesn't really apply. Vote. Without a link. If it's such an existential threat and any OCO causes that, then why isn't it happening? That's so not what our argument is. Our argument is that they view offensive cyber operations that actually hurt their operations. They That's what our shut down their grid. Can I finish? They did not shut down their grid for the they record. Have, they got access to the grid and then two days later promptly were kicked out. So I'm not sure why you're saying that you can't down no, the grid. It, you don't have Reuters to evidence is conceded and it says that they literally kicked us out of the grid after two days. You, but the bigger like, problem is that y'all aren't answering the nuance of our argument. Our argument is not necessarily that any like any cyber operation against Russia triggers our impacts. Our argument
argument is that any operation which they view as undermining their foreign policy goals, that's the Cherovich evidence, sure. is what's going to trigger our What is their foreign never policy talks goals? about any specific, like, like not like any like, little like, intervention. Okay, sure, so what is their foreign policy I don't know. Goals? I mean, they have a ton of foreign policy goals. What? So, like, I don't know. Like, Why does that matter? Baby. Would it be like maintaining stability? Why does it matter what their foreign policy is? Because it matters in terms of what their calculus no. is. It matters for our argument that Russia sees us as undermining them. They can be whatever they want. Sure, but the what are their foreign policy the goals that they want? The fact that Russia thinks okay. that they're being Here's my question. The Why do they care about us undermining them? Because they don't because because everybody has foreign policy goals. goals. Like, yeah, so, so what are those foreign policy goals? If you're the leader of a country goals. and you don't really care about your foreign policy goals being undermined, you're a pretty bad leader. Would you say that one of <laughs> Russia's foreign policy goals is to ensure that there is stability in the globe so that they can That's not a, I would say not, not really. really. <laughs> like, Russia is like a pretty unstable so then why haven't they attacked, attacked us yet? They haven't attacked us because they, they haven't, haven't felt undermined to provoke them. We haven't done an operation that triggers. You can have a question. Okay. Uh, let's talk about your, was like your the, the recruiting, like, like the, the social media. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, my question is: Does ISIS have a lot of like propaganda, like people who are registered their propaganda right now? Yeah, like anyone can post on social media. It's not like a big scale. So we have to shut down every single ISIS person's social media. Ever. No, they run their accounts out of 10, 10 core ISIS media accounts. In a, yeah, okay. out of 10 core accounts, exactly. Sure. When we did OCOs, we shut down all 10 accounts, which is why the vast evidence that you can see literally says that you collapsed all of um, ISIS's propaganda so after the operation. Does it matter if there are accounts or not accounts if all the people who would be posting on those accounts are dead? Other people can post on accounts, man. No, our argument is that they have a propaganda team, which is what actually keeps their operation. Sure, the propaganda team will just be your diet. Yeah. We have a little more right now. engagement turn. All they say is that the U.S. creates bad norms. But Ryan front lines this in summary when he says that Russia and the uh, United States and China will all be working together. The reason for this is because they want global stability. That is the fisher keller evidence, which indicates that their foreign policy goal is to have a go is to have a cyberspace that benefits all. The reason why persistent engagement works is really critical because once the United States does OCOs at a level that is, uh, that is a threshold below war, that ensures that countries can create norms because the cyberspace is constantly evolving. The only way that they can be sure of each other's capabilities is if they constantly attack each other at a, um, at a minimal level. That is exactly why escalation hasn't happened yet, and that is exactly why our turn out is on a short circuit, because before escalation can even happen, those countries are, uh, the, because b before escalation even happens, mistrust is decreased to the point where they don't even feel threatened anymore. But now let's go to our case. On our case, we explained what the Rasmussen evidence is that Trump is pulling out troops right now, which is exactly why Vavra concludes that without troops, the only way that you can curb ISIS is through OCOs. This goes cold and seated. We impact with, we link in with our media warrant. The Temple Rasmussen evidence indicates that Operation Global Intensity in the past has empirically reduced ISIS media capabilities to the point where they literally had no return. That is really crucial because they uh, because they were a shadow of their former self. That is crucial because the Castleberry evidence indicates that uh, that the only that the only way that you can have a physical revival is that they have a media revival, and the reason for that is because they have recruitment. They need to have coordination. They talk about intelligence, but first of all, they provide no warrant. We provide a counter warrant about how OCOs increase intelligence because once you're seeing each other's vulnerabilities, you can increase, you can see what ISIS's vulnerabilities are even more. But then second of all, we would say that empirics are literally on our side at the point where Temple Rastin concludes that it, despite the fact that we, even if there was a decreased intelligence, we were still able to do the operation. That is really crucial because we link into our impact about 18,000 people dying. But even if we don't buy the impact about 18,000 people dying, we still link into the Kagan impact. They drop a very clear portion of Ryan's summary when he talks about how ISIS is more likely to attack. This is really crucial because the Graham evidence goes cold conceded that Russia is never going to do a nuclear attack because they have international checks and they care about international trade. Whereas the Doffman evidence indicates that if ISIS were to revive, that would cause a collapse of the global order because ISIS is literally so reckless that it doesn't even matter. At that point, that outweighs anything that, tried, uh, that they try to do on the Kagan impact because that would also lead to extinction. But even if you don't find that, recessions are short term and whereas ISIS is a long term threat, which means that our Kagan impact still applies there, which means that if there's not a, the United States hegemon anymore, that means that we're going to be, uh, that means that we link into extinction and the class of the goal or order which outweighs anything that they can do.
experience that. on their case, then go to ours. Is everyone ready? Start on their case. They lose the round when they concede the Nakashima evidence about propaganda. What we tell you is the reason why the propaganda cannot function is because we literally killed all of their propaganda artists. That means that if they are even, like, even if they are able to, like, shut down the account and there's no one behind them to run them because we already shot them all or, like, drone strike them all, that means that they have no access to their impact. They have no link because they have no, like, there's no possibility that the ISIS propaganda arm resurges so far as they're literally all dead, but we're also winning the intelligence turn if we don't want to vote on conceded terminal defense. Here's why. We tell you that when we use our OCOs against the ISIS network, ISIS knows that we are there and is able to switch to a new network. They say we have no warrant. That is our warrant. They're misunderstanding it. But then they say that we're able to like follow them and we have intelligence on them. The problem is that's our argument. We have intelligence in the status quo. When you vote for when, when you keep up OCOs, that means you divert the intelligence away. You're not able to have the intelligence more to where they switch to a next network. They say empirics are on their side, but we always say there's a ton of other things that the US did against ISIS in the same time frame. It's impossible to evaluate empirics. That means that we win the prerequisite. Analysis that in order to have a functional kind of terror operation, you need to have intelligence forces. They themselves tell you that we're winning the ISIS debate so cleanly. Let's go to our case. On the way, they can see that the, if a global recession happens, the entire world look in, looks inward and not just the U.S. and eventually stronger link into the looking inward argument. They just say short term, they just assert that you're going to go for the scope here. And then let's go to their, their turn on Fisher Keller. They just say that like there's going to be a persistent engagement. The first problem is this is just a completely new implication in the final focus. The second problem is that we would say that there's not necessarily, not everyone has the same incentives for global stability. People will also want to launch cyber attacks against each other. That's what our goal evidence says. The third thing is we tell them that Russia's perception of OCOs is uniquely negative because of that we have four Policy. Let's go to our links. The cherished evidence finds is that it, that, 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 that if you OCS is uniquely undermining their foreign policy, the Kashuk evidence that they the UN is an extra under threat, and the Lake evidence that they're going to retaliate if they feel undermined. That means that we gain clean access to our link. That when they hack our grid, that plunges that plunges the US into a recession, which spreads global. Nine hundred million people get plunged into poverty. They say that like ISIS is more likely to attack us, but if ISIS does not have the money to attack us, they're never going to win this link anyway. But moreover, they also they, they, it's about nuclear weapons. We're talking about like the grid specifically. 